Well, he's too small. He could dribble, but not great. He's not a great shooter. That was a scouting report that was given for a young player coming out of North Carolina in 1984. In the age of the big men in the NBA, uh, when size and physicality won the day. And so in that draft, the first player that was chosen in the NBA draft was a seven-footer named Hakeem Olajuwon. And then followed by a Lebanon graduate, young, young man from Lebanon, seven foot, one inches tall, Sam Bowie. And Chicago, in the third pick, decided to go with the six foot, six inch, 195 pound Michael Jordan. Believing all the same reports, not sure if he could shoot or could dribble, weren't sure what they would get out of him. They thought maybe he could help their organization, but nobody expected what he would actually accomplish. Nobody expected that Michael Jordan would enter the category of arguably one of the greatest players to ever play the game, if not the greatest. They never expected that he would win six championships. They never expected that he would forever change the landscape of the NBA, bring popularity to the NBA that they had never seen before. Nobody expected it except for maybe Michael. And the truth is, you may not even know basketball or care, but I venture to say you know the name Michael Jordan. Because he had done something that so transcended his game that everybody in the 90s wanted to be like Mike. And I might even just say Michael, and your mind might go to Michael Jordan. It's interesting to me, the last season he played was in 2003. If you could call it that, he came back and played for the Washington Wizards, and it was kind of a weird comeback thing. So it was even years before that since he really played. It was plus 20 years ago. And... Young men and women still want to buy Jordan shoes. That's the impact that he had. Now, none of that really means anything. But it sets the stage for us to understand that we are a part of something that's similar but so much bigger. We're part of something that nobody really expected to be something. Nobody expected in a little town in the Middle East somewhere, overshadowed by the Roman Empire, that something would begin that would span thousands of years, thousands of miles, and today in a little church in Strauss Town, we're talking about it. Thousands of years ago, a man named Jesus established a kingdom. And it wasn't like anybody expected and yet that kingdom has spanned generations and impacted nations across the globe. His predecessor, John the Baptist, was a strange individual. He ate strange food, wore strange clothes, and stood out in a desert in the Middle East preaching strange messages. And the core of his message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And as Jesus showed up on the scene, John the Baptist would say, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he would baptize Jesus, and Jesus would spend time in the wilderness, tempted by Satan, and he would begin his ministry after that moment, and his message would be the same, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And as Jesus continued and worked through his ministry, he heals a, a man who was mute, casting out a demon, and he was accused of doing it by the power of the devil. And Jesus defends himself, and he says, if I have done this thing by the very finger of God, then the kingdom is here. And so Jesus reveals to us that a kingdom has come. Unlike any kingdom that they had ever expected, that kingdom has forever changed our world. And for them... They weren't expecting this type of arrival. They expected some apocalyptic arrival in which the Messiah, the king of Jerusalem, would show up, overthrow Rome, establish their kingdom. And so when Jesus spoke about kingdom, they were expecting that. And they found it hard to, to perceive what he was doing and what was happening around him. But Jesus would say this. He says, what is the kingdom like or what can I compare it to? 
He says, the kingdom is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. What can I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. In their expectations, Jesus says to them that the kingdom that he was beginning had small beginnings. The, the, the allegories that he used, the illustration that he used, they're, they're revealing that it's a small start. A mustard seed was a very small seed, not the smallest seed in the world, but for them and their cultural understanding of the things that they experienced, it was the smallest seed that they worked with. But what it would grow to be was so massive in expectation. This tiny little seed becoming this tree or this bush in a garden, the largest tree in a garden that would allow birds to come and nest in the leaves. And Jesus is saying it has a small beginning. I'm not a baker. Don't do a lot of baking. I did make dough when I worked at a pizza shop in high school. But what I do know is it doesn't take a whole lot of yeast to permeate the whole batch of dough. And again, Jesus is saying it's a small beginning. It's very small in its start, but it's massive in its impact and what it accomplishes. And for them, that's not what they perceived. They wanted something bigger, even though their prophets spoke of something very different. Isaiah wrote this in speaking about the coming Messiah. He said, he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. So again, referring to that mustard seed concept. He didn't have any form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. As Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah shows up, it's not going to be in majesty and when the Messiah showed up, when this man Jesus was born, it was in a little town called Bethlehem in the middle of nowhere in a feeding trough with an audience of animals and the stench of their manure and cobwebs in the rafters and nothing but dust of hay. That's where the Messiah, the king, shows up. And he grew up in a region known as Galilee, which many people in their cultural setting looked down upon. It was the middle of nowhere. And in that region, he lived in a city or grew up in a town called Nazareth, which was the middle of nowhere in the middle of nowhere. Nobody thought highly of this place, and nobody expected great things to come from this place. In fact, when one of the early disciples, Philip, came to find Jesus, he ran to his friend Nathaniel, and he said to Nathaniel, we have found the one whom Moses spoke of, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's response is, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? It was a rhetorical question because in their perspective, nothing good would ever come from such a small beginning, from such a small town. And yet from this small beginning, God would have massive impact. God would begin to do something that would forever change the landscape of our world. Much like this tree or this mustard seed that would grow up and become a tree, it would have huge impacts, much further than what we would ever expect. And it was kind of digging through commentaries, looking at this passage, and some were sort of arguing that maybe those birds nesting in the tree was a, a picture of evil, false teachers coming into the church. Oftentimes leaven is spoken of in the scripture as evil. Maybe that's what they're talking about, which that's not uncommon in the, in, in the Bible and the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, but I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. He's speaking of a good thing. If you, were, if you were to read in the Old Testament, there's a period of time in which the nation of Israel was taken captive by Babylon, a great empire. And while in captivity, a young man named Daniel was given a position of authority there. He was an Israelite who, because of his skill set and because of God's working in his life, the king Nebuchadnezzar gave him a position of authority. He was an advisor. He was an individual that Nebuchadnezzar would go to. And one night, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had this dream. And in the dream, he saw this tree. And this tree was beautiful and massive. And all of the beasts of the field would come and rest under its shade. And the birds would nest in its leaves. And everybody around fed off of this tree. It benefited everybody. It was a good thing. But then, in the dream, he hears somebody speak. Somebody that he, he recognized was higher than himself. And that person said, cut the tree down. 
So he goes to Daniel, and Daniel gives him the interpretation. Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the tree. You represent a kingdom that God has given you that the rest of the world, everybody around us benefits from. But you have forgotten that the Most High reigns over all earthly kingdoms. And because you have forgotten about that, he will cut you low. It was a good thing. So as Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven being like this mustard seed that grows into a tree that the birds come and nest in, I think we're the birds. We're the Gentiles outside of Israel who get to nest in the kingdom of God and experience the beauties and blessings of it. In fact, one of the, the other prophets, Ezekiel, said something similar, speaking about Egypt being like a tree. And later he would, he would give this imagery of an eagle flying in and taking a sprig from the top of this great cedar and planting it in Zion, the city of God, which didn't just represent a city in Jerusalem, it ultimately represented God's kingdom. And out of that sprig would grow this massive tree that would benefit everybody. He was prophetically speaking of the kingdom that Jesus would begin. Small beginnings, but huge impact. Just think about it for a moment. Here's this man from Nazareth, the middle of nowhere. He begins to develop a little following of a weird bunch of guys. Tax collectors, zealots, fishermen. They add some ladies. There's Martha and Mary and some other Marys. Some had been from a past of sexual sin. Others had lived with demonic oppression. They start following the group. And then later, other guys like Nicodemus, who wasn't real sure about Jesus, follows. And then a man named Joseph follows. And then Jesus dies on the cross. He comes back to life. And we're told that over 500 people saw the risen Lord. And they go and they keep preaching about this, this kingdom that was planted, this mustard seed that was planted. And it starts to impact in Jerusalem. You get into the book of Acts and Peter and John are preaching this kingdom of God. And they come across a man who had been born lame. And for 40 years he could not walk. And people would pick him up and set him at the temple so he can beg. And he's sitting, he's laying there begging. Peter and John walk by and he's begging and they see him. And Peter says, gold and silver we do not have. If you're a beggar, that's not the first thing you want to hear. Thanks for wasting my time, sir. Peter says, look at me. Gold and silver we do not have. Okay. But what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And instantly, this man who had never walked in his life stood up and began to walk. Think about that. I don't know if you ever hurt your leg, fractured something, broke something. When I was 27 years old, I fractured my right ankle. Fortunately, it was my brake foot, so I could still ride the motorcycle with the boot on. But I fractured my ankle, and in my mind, I knew I had six weeks, eight weeks, I'm going to be in this boot. The moment this boot comes off, I'm going back to playing basketball, and that's what I thought was going to occur. So I took the boot off, I went to play basketball, and I could not move. I couldn't cut, I couldn't jump. Guys that I used to check, I couldn't check. They're, they're toasting me. Guys that I was school are shutting me down. I almost gave up. I'm like, I'm never playing basketball. If this is how basketball is, I'm not playing basketball anymore. But what I didn't realize is that those muscles atrophy and all those little muscle fibers in your leg, they, they have to relearn how to function, and it took time to redevelop that. Think about the, the miracle of this moment. At no point in this man's life had his brain and his foot functioned together. And instantly, they function, he stands, he walks, and it says he was leaping for praise in the temple. Who did it? Well, that would be the question the same religious leaders who killed Jesus would ask Peter and John. By whose name are you doing these things? Here's their answer. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Notice the description Peter gives. Not Jesus Christ the Lord, not Jesus Christ the King, 
Jesus Christ from the middle of nowhere that nobody would expect, would expect anything good to come from. It's by his power that this man walks, and it's by his power the world would be changed. And in Jerusalem, thousands more would add to the kingdom. And that kingdom would spread into Africa and into Asia, and it would eventually cross through generation after generation to find its way to Burnville and Stroustown and Schuylkillhaven and Reading, and the kingdom just keeps growing. That's the power of Jesus of Nazareth. So when we find ourselves saying, God could never use me, he could never use me because of where I've come from or what I've done, remember where our kingdom started. In the middle of nowhere with somebody nobody ever would have expected. And it's totally turned the world upside down. I think about the fact that God's kingdom stretched over generation and generation, over land and sea to finally get to a young man in a steel town in Sharon, Pennsylvania. And God's kingdom kept growing and it met Jody, who we celebrated her baptism a week or two ago. And it didn't care where we came from or what we did or who we were, how significant or insignificant the world might see us to be. The kingdom reached us and it continues like branches from the mustard seed reaching into other people. That's the power of the kingdom. That's the impact of this massive kingdom of God. It continues to change our world. And I recognize that there are still people who don't expect it. They doubt it. They mock it. And I'll I'll be honest, there was a time in my life when people would mock God and mock the kingdom of God that it would bother me, but I've gotten to a place where I actually find it semi-humorous and also saddening at the same time. I find it humorous because of this reason. I was having a conversation with somebody not long ago, and he said, listen, I, I buy the whole God thing, I'll give you that, but I don't buy any biblical text. Texts are fabricated by men to control men. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so let's walk that through. Let's say it was just some men that fabricated. Give give me the basic assumption that it was these men, Peter, James, John, that it was those men who fabricated this idea. You are telling me then that they are the most brilliant and also diabolical human beings to ever live on the face of the earth. Brilliant because they figured out how to fabricate a story that would span millions and millions of people over thousands of years and continue to grow across the globe. You know how hard it is to get just two people to agree on the same thing and say the same story over a length of time? I just watched something recently. A detective was talking about that. He's saying just to get two people to corroborate a lie over a stretch of time is nearly impossible. You're telling me hundreds of people said they saw the, li- the living risen Lord, continued to tell that story over generation, died for that story, millions more added to it and continue to be added to it, that that kingdom expands across our globe. You're telling me that somebody fabricated that? It's just illogical. What I recognize and why I say it's humorous is because individuals have mocked and tried to stop the growth of God's kingdom for generation. And while those empires have come and gone, God's kingdom continues to grow. And it's saddening because while we try to establish our own kingdoms, our kingdoms will come and go. And we could miss out on the kingdom of God that's far greater than any kingdom we could ever pursue. The truth of the matter is, the bottom line is this, God's kingdom is growing. Is it growing in you? Nothing will stop the kingdom of God. Nothing will stop its growth and its movement. God is going to do what he has planned to do. But I I have to ask myself, is God's kingdom growing in me? Is it shaping the way I earn and use my money? Is it shaping the way I talk and post? Is it shaping the pursuits of my life and the decisions that I make? Is God's kingdom the kingdom that I'm actually trying to branch out into the world? 
what I find too often is there's much smaller kingdoms that I'm trying to establish. And my resources, my time, my rhetoric tends to go towards smaller kingdoms. God's kingdom is greater. It just is. And when I fail to realize that the most high God reigns over every human kingdom, I try to establish a much smaller kingdom, the little kingdom of Phil, that will come and go like every other empire in this world, while God's kingdom will keep growing. I want his kingdom to take root in me. I want it to permeate everything that I do and everything that I am. And when I look at this text, Jesus says it's like a seed that a man took hold of and planted. There's intentionality to it. I need to take hold of God's kingdom and root it in my heart and life. It's like yeast or, or leaven that a woman took hold of and mixed, intentionally grabbing hold of it and placing it somewhere. God is doing that in the world, but am I doing that in my own heart? Am I planting the kingdom of God in my own life so that it permeates everything that I am and everything that I do? If God has taken this mustard seed and planted it and it's grown into this tree that nobody would have expected, are those branches continuing to extend through me? Am I a shade to other people? Do I offer comfort peace and protection to other people through the good news of the kingdom? Am I adding to somebody else's life? Am I a benefit to somebody else's life? Am I helping raise people up? Am I building people up or am I tearing them down? Is the kingdom at root in my life and branching out from me? Perhaps is the kingdom rooting out the strongholds and the fortresses of lies and deception that God has placed in my own heart and life? or that the devil's placed in my own heart and life. It's the kingdom of God rooting that out. I think about what Paul said. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's warfare terminology. And Paul is saying that inside me there are fortresses, strongholds. How do you overcome a stronghold? You wage war against it. And there's strongholds of lies and deception, whether they're lies of arrogance that tell me I can do this on my own, I will build my own kingdom, or there are lies of unworthiness that tell me I could never be who God wants me to be. I need to attack those fortresses with the truth of God's word and tear down those strongholds. The, the truth is, The power of the man of Nazareth is the power that is in those who believe in him. And it's by that power that we pull down strongholds and lies and deception that tell us that we are something that we are not, whether in arrogance or in unworthiness. We began to consider what it meant, what a kingdom was in the first place. I, I wrestled with... Jesus says the kingdom's here, so there's something about it that's already present. And then we have this concept biblically of a kingdom we're anticipating. What is he talking about? Which, which is which? So I started thinking of the components of a kingdom. The truth is a kingdom has a king. And you and I are not that. We are not the king. Jesus is the king. And so for the the seed of the kingdom to take root in me, the first step is to recognize I am not king, I am not queen, Jesus is king, he is Lord. It also has inhabitants. And here's the beautiful thing about the kingdom of God. All those who believe in Jesus Christ become a part, citizens of the kingdom of God, not as peasants, but as heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ of the kingdom. You and I become heirs through belief in Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And there is a reality that there are parameters to a kingdom. There's a scope of where it reigns and the borders of that kingdom. And perhaps that's the component that that is yet to come. 
God, Christ is coming again. His kingdom is in us because he is Lord. We are in the, the inhabitants of the kingdom, so we're living out the kingdom. But the parameters have yet to be set in our world. And too often I think we focus on that, that we become much like the Israelites waiting for some apocalyptic arrival to destroy all evil and establish the parameters instead of being ambassadors of a kingdom that invites all others to be a part of it. Were it not for the grace of Jesus Christ, you and I would still be on the outside looking into. If Jesus had done what the Israelites wanted him to do, he would have walked into Jerusalem, overthrown Rome, established a kingdom that they would not have allowed to be a part of because they were unrighteous. But instead, Jesus walked into Jerusalem, walked to a cross, took your unrighteousness, my unrighteousness, their unrighteousness, and wore the wrath of that from God on the cross and then came back to life to give you and I new life and righteousness so that now we can actually enter the kingdom. So until that day comes, we are ambassadors of a kingdom. And instead of sitting on our hands, waiting for God to usher it in, we should be compelled to invite more to be a part of it. We should be compelled to be branches of that mustard seed that grow out into the world around us that cause others to accept the free invite, the free gift of eternal life as heirs in the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is growing. But is it growing in you and me? Is it changing how we think, how we act, how we live? Is it permeating everything that we are? Or are we still building smaller kingdoms? I believe that this same kingdom that thousands of years ago started turning the world upside down will turn your world upside down too. I'm not saying it will make your life easier. Paul actually said this in Acts. He said, through many trials we will enter the kingdom. It's not going to be easy but it'll be transformative. I pray that you are a part of that kingdom and that if you are, you are acting as a branch of the mustard seed, impacting the world around you and inviting others to be a part of it as well. I saw an example of this. Recently, I had to officiate a funeral service for a friend of mine. His grandfather passed away. Many of us may never know who he is. You may never have interacted with him. But I saw a legacy of a man who was impacted by the kingdom of God and therefore that kingdom spread to the people around him. I saw a legacy of commitment and faith. When he passed away, he and his wife were about 10 days away from 65 years of marriage. They could have retired in marriage. And those things to me, I celebrate that. But see individual, and not just we're roommates in marriage, like we live in the same house. They loved each other and cared for each other. As he was declining in his body and declining in his mind, she would care for him. And as the grandkids and the kids would say, Mom, let us help, she'd say, no, for better or for worse. I made a vow. Here was a man who had impact in his community. He was, worked and oversaw a lot of grocery stores in the Reading area, and he would reach out to people, and he'd care for people, and he'd be generous. And at one point he had a, a woman come in and she was shoplifting. He caught her shoplifting. And instead of calling the police, he brought her in the back and he, he, he asked her, he said, tell me your story. And hearing her story he began to understand why she was doing what she was doing. And he said, listen, it's not worth it. Ask for help. And he sent her away. And here was a man who, when he finished his eighth grade year, he was done with school. And yet the family began digging through some of his notes and they found notebook after some of the fold over notebooks, five, six, seven different notebooks filled with his own writing of times he spent in the word and times he spent with God. And I'm telling you, I'm digging through this stuff, it's theologically deep. He's writing stuff about the argument against polytheism. This guy was a theologian. 
eighth grade education in the presence of God, digging through the Word, writing on stuff that most of us wouldn't even think about or care about. And it was clear that God's kingdom had impacted his heart and life. And the evidence of it was in his children and his children's children and his children's children. And the world globally may never know his name. But his world, the sphere of influence that God placed him in, was impacted by the kingdom of God. I don't care where you've come from. Middle of nowhere, middle of nowhere. All it takes is the kingdom of God growing in us to have an impact in our world that is unlike any other. Small beginnings, but massive impact. Is the God's kingdom growing in you? Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful for your kingdom. I know that I've spent too many times in my life or too many years building the small kingdom of me. And too often my, my thoughts and my finances and my energy gets focused on smaller kingdoms. Lord, you planted a kingdom years ago in a small little town in the Middle East and it's changed the world. And empires have come and gone, and yet nothing has stopped the growth of this kingdom. So much so that it's grown into this church, CFC, and it's changed lives, it's transformed hearts. But Lord, I pray for us as we anticipate your arrival, we anticipate the establishment of your parameters of that kingdom. Lord, I pray that we would not just sit watching, but that we would be ambassadors of your kingdom, sharing the good news that the God of heaven invites us into a kingdom as heirs through belief in his son, Jesus Christ. That we would share that truth with others no matter who they are or what they've done. That we would remember when we feel doubts, senses of unworthiness, that we would remember where this kingdom started. In a place where everyone said nothing good could ever come from it. And look at what is done today. Lord, use us and let your kingdom grow in us. In Jesus' name, amen.